Video Games Recon. Hello and welcome. My name is Nate from Video Games Recon, and in this video, it's time for another Retro Top 10. This time, we're going to be checking out my Top 10 Super Nintendo games. Now, I have to admit, I may not be the most qualified person in the world on this topic, being more of a Sega Mega Drive kind of guy, and unlike today, Back when I was a kid, it was very unlikely that you'd own more than one system, unless you were rich. But that said, I've enjoyed many a time in my youth playing a SNES, as we would do prolonged swaps with friends and relatives for weeks if not months at a time. So we'd get to play their back catalogue and would often also rent a console and games bundles at weekends. Yep, that's right, rent a console. I'm sure it probably sounds like I'm speaking a different language to those of you from a much younger generation, seeing as having multiple consoles within a household is commonplace now. And even something like a video game rental shop seems like a ridiculous idea these days. But that was the world we lived in back then, a simpler time. Before early access, DLC, trolls, not that sort of troll, even back in the day we had them. DRM and console wars. As everyone knows that blast processing was superior to the Super FX chip, so there was never really a contest. The Genesis wins hands down. Ah, maybe scratch that last one? Anywho, as per usual, there won't be any multiples from a franchise in this list. And again, I want to put the disclaimer out there that this video is completely opinion based and is more a matter of personal preference than anything else. And as such, there is no such thing as a definitive top 10. So, instead of going nuts and raging out in the comments that your favourite game isn't in this list or in the right position, why not join in and have a rational conversation with me and others in the comments section and post what your top 10 SNES games would be. Anywho, without any further ado, let's do it to it. 10. Donkey Kong Country in at 10, one of the characters that helped kick off a gaming revolution for Nintendo, along with Jumpman, or as he's better known today, Mario, in the seminal video game that is Donkey Kong. However, after a couple of lackluster sequels, Donkey Kong took a significant hiatus from our lives, until 1994 with the graphically beautiful platformer that is Donkey Kong Country. And speaking of graphics, although it may not look much by today's standards, this game had one of, if not the best visuals for this generation of gaming, using pre-rendered 3D graphics similar to games like Vectorman or the digitized sprites of Pit Fighter. And aside from its cutting edge graphics, it's an incredibly fun and accessible platform that stands on its own two feet even without its fancy graphics. And that's why it's at number 10 in my list. Star Fox. Star Fox, otherwise known as Starwing across the pond here in Europe, is yet another example of the Super Nintendo flexing its graphical muscle over the Genesis with its fancy Super FX chip. Being able to produce actual 3D polygons instead of pre rendered 3D graphics like Donkey Kong. Again, it doesn't look much now. But outside of arcade machines, 3D polygons on a home console was pretty much unheard of, aside from a few very rare cases, and most of those, again, are on the SNES. Aside from this, Star Fox is a quality third-person on-rails space shooter, with an almost assault course style map design, and a nice touch that you could choose your own path as to what levels of the game you'd play through, and like most games of this era, a fairly steep learning curve. If I was to describe Star Fox to a friend in one sentence, I'd say, think, a retro Star Wars game with pioneering graphics and talking animals. Hell, what's not to like? Eight, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time. Okay. First off, I'm not going to be repeating that entire name each time, as it starts to sound like a tongue twister. Anyway, admittedly I didn't get to play this game too much at the time, at least on the SNES, 
However, I did extensively play the arcade game within which this was based off, and that game was addictive and mesmerising in equal measure. I'm sure to the annoyance and detriment of the parents of my generation's wallets. So, how does Turtles in Time stack up? Well, for a home console, it's not going to have quite the same power as an arcade machine, but still manages a pretty decent bang for its buck, with good graphics and visuals, especially when you throw a foot soldier off screen, a quality soundtrack, if different to the arcade version, and most importantly great, if a little simple gameplay, as this game pretty much only uses two buttons. Also, each character has their own distinctive moves, which wasn't always the case of similar games in this era. So all in all, an excellent home console interpretation. There's bags of fun, especially if you've got a buddy to play with. And the only reason it's not higher on this list is due to the competition of the SNES games vying for a place in this top 10, and that the Mega Drive version of this game, Hyperstone Heist, has many superior features. Seven, Chrono Trigger. Chrono Trigger is one of those games given mythical status within the RPG genre, and as such, I knew it was a game I had to check out when making this list. As alas, I never got to play back in the day, mainly because, to the best of my knowledge, it wasn't released in Europe until the Nintendo DS port many years later. So unfortunately, I had to play this one retrospectively without the rose-tinted glasses of nostalgia. But in a weird way that's a good thing, as luckily I wasn't at all disappointed with this game, which is always a worry with being spoilt by the standards in gaming in the modern era. Obviously excluding shitstorms like Early Access. And it's not difficult to figure out why I was pleasantly surprised, with Chrono Trigger having pioneering features like planned enemy encounters, magic and spells that have an area effect, a cool story mechanic where you travel through time, changing historical events so as to change the future to your benefit, and being able to combine the special skills of your characters so as to make a super special team move. And on top of this, the game looked great for the period, and it has that typical classic square RPG feel, being very well polished with high production values. And when I discover this game features the holy trinity of RPG gaming, FYI I'm not even going to try and butcher their names as the first developer within this trio is none other than the creator of the Final Fantasy series. Next is the creator of Enix's Dragon Quest series, obviously before the merger of Square Enix. And last but by no means least, Chrono Trigger featured the art from the creative talents behind both Dragon Quest and Dragon Ball Z. How, with that Dream Team's involvement, it's no wonder this game still manages to hold up to this very day. Six, Final Fantasy VI. Renamed from Final Fantasy III to Final Fantasy VI in the US, and I think Europe, for seemingly no reason, is unfortunately yet another game I've had to play retrospectively. Again, I'd heard so many good things about this game, and being a Final Fantasy VII fanboy, had some trepidation about this game living up to the hype. But my concerns were unfounded, as this game was a joy to play. I had set myself maybe an hour tops to capture the footage for this game, and got completely absorbed into this game's rich story and familiar gameplay mechanics, and lost complete track of time. Sure, the game suffers a little without the nostalgia due to the 16-bit graphics, but still manages to look beautiful, thus is easily overlooked after getting accustomed to the style. And I can totally see what people are talking about when it comes to the villain of the piece, Kefka who's one part Sephiroth, one part the Joker, and one part Vass from Far Cry 3, retrospectively speaking. If only Square had managed to keep that lineage throughout future titles, I'm sure many of the bad guys would have been much more interesting. People keep going on about Final Fantasy VII reboot, myself included, but after playing this game, 
I'm starting to think a Final Fantasy VI reboot might be a much better shout. Either way, this is an awesome game that holds up to this day, and is quite possibly the best 16-bit RPG ever. Enough said. Five, Street Fighter 2. Finally, it's about time for some 90s button mashing beat em up tournament based martial arts violence. Well, that's not something I thought I'd be saying when I woke up this morning. Anyway, when you've got a hankering for punching your friends in the face and mocking them after, and didn't fancy doing some serious jail time, then Street Fighter 2 was one of few outlets for these sorts of shenanigans on a 16 bit console. Ported over from the excellent arcade game of the same name, this thing pretty much single-handedly invented the tournament fighting genre, or at very least popularised this sort of game. It may sound funny, but things like command-based special moves, lots of characters to choose from, each with different moves, and tournament-style fighting was pioneering back in 1991, and was pretty much unrivaled, aside from a few contenders. Mortal Kombat on the Mega Drive and Samurai Showdown on the Neo Geo, which was pretty much inaccessible to most people, unless you played the arcade version. Aside from this, there's not a whole lot to say you probably don't already know, unless you've been living in a cave for the past 20 years plus. Put simply, it looked good, sounded good, played good, especially with friends, and still does. Four, Super Mario World. Ah, Super Mario World. What a game. This thing is ridiculous. It's hard to believe that this game was created in 1990, nearly 25 years ago. Meaning this game is probably older than at least a third of the people watching this video. And if I was to release this title today on mobile or any of the big three consoles digital storefront, you wouldn't bat an eyelid. Well, perhaps not a Mario game on a PSN or Xbox Live store, but you get what I'm saying. I had to do a double take when I saw when this was released. I thought it would be at least 94 or 95, but to my surprise, this was a launch title bundled in with the console. Now that's a way to make a statement. Perhaps the Nintendo of today should take note. Super Mario looked beautiful, sounded beautiful, and played beautifully. On top of which, it had options to go back and play old levels and collect optional extras, and secret areas and save points, which were a new feature for platformers. And if that didn't convince you, then surely the debut of that lovable rogue Yoshi will. If not, I'd start to wonder whether you're actually a human or not, and instead of some sort of replicant who has fooled themselves into believing they are human. If so, you might want to look into that. Just saying. Three, Super Metroid. Super Metroid, more like Super Spooky. This game was revolutionary in so many ways. Let's start off with the Spooky. This game starts off like no other from this period. Carrying off from Metroid 2, Samus takes the captured Metroid to a research station so as to learn about its properties and keep it safe before going on her way. Just when she's flying off into the sunset, she gets an alert that the station's under attack. So, sounds like a typical story narrative, even of its time, right? Well, where this game changes is when the game actually starts, as you arrive on the planet with no clear direction or clue as to what's happening, as you creep about the now empty colony facilities aside from the odd corpse, and must find out what's going on and how this happened. Not only is the story creepily atmospheric and captivating in equal measure, but the gameplay is your typical solid Metroid gameplay that you know and love from Metroid 1 and 2. But now it's even more of an open world, 
There is no strict way to go, no hand holding, you can go investigate wherever you want, pretty much whenever you want, within reason. I'm not sure if Metroid is the first platform shooter to do this or not, but either way it's definitely revolutionary. Again, this stuff seems dime a dozen these days, with games like Bioshock, Resident Evil, Metal Gear Solid, Silent Hill, the list goes on. Put simply, without a Metroid or a Super Metroid, there may have never been a Metal Gear or Resident Evil. For that reason alone, it deserves its spot as number 3 on my list. Two, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. A Link to the Past? Ah, gotta love pun based titles. This game is the third instalment within the Zelda series. This time going back to its roots, reverting back to an overhead view akin to Zelda 1, instead of the side scrolling view found in Zelda 2. Much like in Super Metroid, the Zelda games have always been designed to be non linear and open world and A Link to the Past is no exception here. However, there is a lot more of a guiding hand in this one, encouraging you not to stray too far from the path. Aside from looking great, the gameplay is still everything people loved about Zelda 1 and more. With that, there's a lot of bang for your buck here. The amount of dungeons to explore for a game of this era is pretty mind-boggling. And this is yet another game in this list that lives up to the hype, and still feels relevant. Again, if this or a game like it was released on iOS or Android, it would still be a lot better than a large proportion of the games available on those platforms now. Yet another great game that I spent more time playing instead of recording footage than I should have, and wasn't at all mad with myself about it either. So, before we reveal our number one game of our top 10 Super Nintendo games list, here's a couple of honourable mentions that just missed out. Super Punch-Out, Earthbound, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, Contra 3, Mega Man X. And our number one Super Nintendo game of all time had to be, and I don't even care a little bit if it's cliche, it could only be the one and only Super Mario Kart. This game is an absolute joy. Even now to this day, Mario Kart has aged so well that I'd rather play this than a number of modern day games. If you're a human with two hands and eyes, then you've probably played this or one of its sequels, which are essentially the same game just with better graphics. Seriously, Nintendo really went with the mantra, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mario Kart is a masterclass in making a driving game fun, realism be damned. If a Super Nintendo was not available to me and my sister at that time, we would rent one for the weekend, pretty much just for this game, and any other titles that we picked up at the rental store along the way was pretty much a bonus. And that right there is part of the reason this franchise is so successful, as it's completely accessible to pretty much anybody little kids like we were, hardcore gamers and even your mum can play this game and not totally suck. Well, maybe just a little bit. Mario Kart had so much going for it, a beautiful and vivid graphic art style which also capitalised on Nintendo's Mode 7 graphics, which gives the illusion of a 3D environment. An amazing soundtrack with songs that will almost certainly resonate with you to this day. Tons of modes, Mario GP and all its formulas, as well as a co-op version time trial where you can race against ghost versions of yourself or someone else, and of course battle mode, which was pretty much a deathmatch tank battle, but where you'd normally have tanks and artillery, you'd swap them out for go-karts and red turtle shells. This mode makes for an incredibly refreshing change of pace from the Mario GP mode, with its own special tactics and nuances. With all that and more, you can see why it's the third best selling game of all time on the SNES, and number one on my list and in my heart. How? You probably already know what I'm talking about here. I don't even really need to tell you something you already know. Seriously, who doesn't like Mario Kart? Aside from maybe a real Italian plumber called Mario, who for good reasons hate all things Mario, Sonic the Hedgehog 
who changed from blue to green with envy on this one, and well, people who were just plain wrong. These are my thoughts and opinions of my favourite top 10 Super Nintendo games, with which I have a great fondness for in terms of nostalgia as well as both the memories gained from being immersed in these worlds, and how so many of these games managed to stay relevant to this very day. So whether you agree with my list or not, feel free to post your favourite games in the comments section. Also, these videos take a while to make, so if you enjoyed watching, I would really appreciate your support in terms of liking, favouriting, sharing and subbing for more BS of a similar nature. With that, I'm all run out of terrible jokes and puns, so feel free to insert your own. I'm off to look through some Christmas crackers and old joke books, so I can stock up for next time. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.